we have got um, a very powerful uh, generation but it comes with a health warning and the health warning and even a wealth warning is that don't write off the boomers welcome to the cashflow academy podcast i'm andy tanner your host this is where we do our very best to make investing and all things money simple uh so excited for today's guest we have ken costa today who is really a global perspective his background is investment banking you've uh, might have seen him in the Wall Street Journal, Telegraph, Financial Times contributor. He's written an amazing book. Before we dive in, I'll remind you to drop by your investingclass.com for goodies and uh, you know all things uh, financial education. And with that, uh, Ken Costa, welcome to the podcast and thanks for taking some time with us today. No way. And thank you for inviting me across the pond uh, and to all those who are listening to me in that strange accent. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very sophisticated and uh, it denotes politeness, which you've uh, certainly shown. Uh, I'm going to let you give a little bit of your background, a lot of philanthropy, time in South Africa, anti-apartheid movement, uh, Church of England. I mean, you know, lots of uh, awards and investment banking. So you have a global experience. Uh, you have a great perspective. Tell us a little bit about your background and what... Uh, what uh, brought you to uh, to write this book? Because Generation Z, I think, might be the most empowered uh, generation in terms of technology, AI, social media norms. They can they have a tremendous burden they're inheriting, but also a lot of power. So, what a little bit of your background and why you wrote the hundred trillion dollar wealth transfer? Uh, how the handover from boomers to Generation Z will revolutionize capitalism. Well, thank you very much. Well, briefly, I grew up in South Africa. Um, it was not a great time. The uh, apartheid government was in in space uh, was in in its uh, in its heyday then, and I just felt a burning sense of the injustice of it. Came to study uh, in England, read law and theology in Cambridge University, then became an investment banker, where I've been and continue to be for the last. Oh, 40 plus years. So I'm in that boomer generation. But what I've noticed uh, is uh, that I wanted to write this book, uh, partly because I w spend so much time, both as chairman uh, of the UBS Investment Bank in Europe, the Middle East and Africa, and chairman of Lazard, uh, and, um, and, uh, and a number of other, other things, I have realized that actually uh, there is a new generation that is growing up and that it is very important for all our future, financial, spiritual, fina uh, social, that we find a way in which we can avoid the deep clashes that have been occurred and the deep divides that have been occur that have occurred um, in between the generations. And if we don't watch out, there will be a clash of generations. So therefore, I, I, I want you to address what is what is an extraordinary phenomenon. I mean, never before. Uh, in, in, in the history, has there been such an enormous amount of financial wealth transferred from one generation to another? But you may say, well, that always happens, Ken. People die and the next generation takes over the house or whatever the wealth might be. The difference is, and I think in part, Andy, you've alluded to it, the difference is that this generation, who I call the Zenial generations, the millennials and the Gen Z, this generation not only will have this huge financial empowerment, uh, a financial wealth transferred, but the power will go with it. And there are the, the areas of, of power are threefold. One, that never before have we seen such technology um, change so rapidly. And they are, they are digital natives. I'm a digital immigrant. I've had to learn in a strange country. They are digital natives. They live in digital in the digital world. And that gives an enormous amount of power to them. Second is the power of, of, of influence in social media, enormous power to be able to swing markets, to make changes, to, to attack people, to have Twitter rages or ZX rages, whatever it might be, that gives enormous power. And then thirdly, a generation that knows exactly what it wants to do with its finances. It wants to do well and do good. And it wants, therefore, to be uh, friendly to the environment, injustice, uh, equality, all those things that uh, th that the, the generation espouses. And if you take this all together, the finance moving over, 
and the and the power moving, we have got um, a very powerful uh, generation. But it comes with a health warning, and the health warning, and even a wealth warning, is that don't write off the boomers. We have a big contribution to make to the Zuma generation. It's a it's a fascinating dynamic that I love to study. Early in my investing career, you know, we're always trying to predict the future, which is probably a fool's errand. But uh, policy and demographics does give insight on the future. If I have a policy or even a culture, and I look at the demographics as they move along in time, that can give me an idea of of where things will go. Uh, I suppose that's why you know politics is such a uh, such a fierce arena because it determines a lot of our future. And mm. when you talk, we'll talk about the wealth transfer because, you know, when you use the word transfer, that implies that something might be bequeathed, inherited, or given as opposed to earned. So we'll, we'll dive. Well, maybe we ought to dive into that right now. When you say this is a transfer, uh, what do you mean in the sense of the word transfer? So I use the word transfer. You can use that. I use the word handover. But are you aware of the, of the, you know, one of the biggest banks in the world, and it's called BOMAD. I don't know whether any of your uh, listeners would have heard of it. It's new to most of us, but it's called the Bank of Mom and Dad. And the <laughs> Bank of Mom and Dad uh, have been the ones that have been helping out in putting deposits down for houses, helping to pay the rent, helping to put money into the college fund. And so it's not that there is in some decade in the future a transfer that might take place then. It's happening now. Uh, there are already assets moving, mostly in terms of enabling uh, a generation, and it spreads all the way down, um, not only the super wealthy waiting for someone to die. And, th and that, of course, is already happening. And as it happens, of course, it's created part of the tension, which is basically your generation looking at me, uh, saying you lived on the fat of the land, you had low interest rates, you didn't know what inflation was, your assets grew, and now we're screwed. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, you know, but 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 in reality, of course, uh, there is this continuing growing uh, sum of money that is being paid uh, regularly to enable a generation to begin to enjoy some of the benefits of a previous generation's hard work into the next and the real question is what are they going to do with it yeah it's interesting uh i'm in my i'm in i'll call it mid 50s we'll call it that maybe okay. a little we'll further we'll along. That. don't worry i'm in my <laughs> mid 70s <laughs> so, so i look at my kids and i had my kids later in life so they are gen zers they were born in that 1990 to uh 2010 20 year period a little over the 2000 mark but it, it is interesting. I, 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 I think they stand to inherit a bunch. You have a more global perspective, I'm sure, than I. When I look at the United States and I look at the fiscal irresponsibility that, that this huge economy has displayed in terms of promised money. In other words, we have you know, money that's been borrowed. We've you know, sold the bonds and that, that money's been funded and spent. We have unfunded liabilities, which are promises that we haven't borrowed money for yet. And those stand at about a little north of $200 trillion. I, In my brain, one of the reasons I was interested to speak to you is I see them in inheriting a lot of power, a lot yes. of technology, a lot of influence. Yes. I also see them inheriting uh, generational debts and obligations uh, that are just un unprecedented. So uh, one of the reasons I, it piqued my interest and why your book piqued my interest is I've always been worried about the world my kids are going to inherit in terms of their obligations to fulfill. What do you see playing out with the massive amount of, of generational debt, even globally, that, that has been, uh, that's going to fall on their shoulders as well? well it, it's naturally a great concern. Um, but one thing one always has to bear in mind, you, 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 we only use one measure, which is what the debt looks like. But if you had a you know, a balance sheet, you'd also want to see what the assets look like. And you'd want to look to see what the assets of the United States are against the future borrowing of the United States. And that's true for the UK and elsewhere. But if, but the way we look at it means we only look at one side of it. Yeah. And the answer, the answer there, in my view, 
is we 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 really have to work hard to uh, for us to understand that you cannot keep increasing debt. It is no that is no way to live. But increased productivity as a result of the technological changes that are coming about, if the economies grow significantly and continue to grow, then I think you'll find that uh, that this in part is the offset. Um, but there's no substitute for a much. And who who am I to? to talk our government as bad as yours in terms of its discipline over the financial, uh, you know, the financial debt. Now we've had COVID and we had to step in and it was right that we did, whether we should have done it to the extent that we did is another matter. But what it, yeah. what it did do is that we mustn't forget that debts have to be repaid and we have to be engaged in the, the next generation to explain. Look, we are a generation who understands uh, inflation, we understand recession, we understand hard times, we understand, you know, having to pay levels of debt that we didn't want, we understand the great global financial crisis. So I think we need the hindsight of our generation, coupled to the insight of that next generation who looking forward to AI and, and, uh, and quantum computing and the changes in technology, that will create a sort of foresight for the new social structure, capitalist structure of that next generation. So, it, yeah, it, it is true they will inherit that, but also they will be economically productive, I believe, far more than we were because of the enabling technology. Let's talk a little bit about the, the subtitle of your book, how the handover from boomers to Gen Z will revolutional, revolutionize capitalism. Talk about this revolution. What does it look like? What is the before picture and after picture uh, as this revolutionizes capitalism? What is the change in capitalism that you see? Well, for the first to say is that if you look back to our generation, my generation, um, the primary driver was that of profit. Um, and I'm sufficient of a capitalist to want to say that it's important. Um yeah. But the difficulty was that actually when when the push came to shove uh, in the global financial crisis, capitalism was found to have, have breached or to have departed from its moral moorings. And it lost the ethical base from which capitalism was meant to grow. And the market economy is uh, a good servant and a very bad master. But it became a master. It became the one that would determine uh, how we were to live, spend our time and our money. And, and as a result of that, trust was completely broken. And the generation grows up with a distrust of financial institutions, any institutions, government, yeah. media. Um, and when you've got that breakdown uh, in, in, the, in social uh, uh, cohesion, then you begin to worry about what that future might look like. So that the reshaped form of capitalism has to take into account a purposeful profit. It has to take into account uh, that the new generation coming into the marketplace have got a very different view of how they want their money invested. For example, they would like their houses to be more environmentally friendly. They would like the clothes that they wear to have come from a provenance from the supply chain. Um, and uh, that, that that doesn't exploit people, whatever it is, there's a mindset change. And we need to be sure that we engage actively in what I call the establishment of socially energized uh, capitalism. Uh, it's social because that's what the, the, they want to be in community and work with community, the next generation. It's energized because it's a highly creative, very energetic group of people, perhaps misguided at times, but you know, a lot of energy. But at the end of the day, it is still capitalism. There is still a reward for risk, for performance, for, for return on capital that we have to be in, involved in this dialogue that, uh, that I talk about in the book. I, I think one of the, the great points you made uh, that, that people might not, they may or may not be focused on is the distrust in today's institutions, whether they be governmental, uh, education, religious, I mean, all these institutions. And I felt like capitalism was revolutionized slightly, uh, or maybe in a maybe more than slightly in the subprime meltdown. Because in capitalism, 
there's success, but it also, you talked about liabilities and assets being balanced. Capitalism was a world of failure as well. And yes. if you have if you have institutions, particularly Wall Street institutions, that are allowed to take on massive risks to seek yeah. massive rewards, when those risks are brought to bear in the name of socialism, we say, well, this is too big to fail. If these big guys fail, it would hurt too many people. I, I really felt there was a huge departure from capitalism where those that took huge risks simply had their toxic assets that were falling apart. Well, the Fed will buy those with money they invent. So I felt like a lot of the capitalists got a free pass in the name of too big to fail. Any, I didn't mean to digress like that, but it, it did but come a, to mind. Sure, Andy. I mean, it's perfectly true. It did happen. I mean, so, uh, and, and the consequence of it is that a generation grew up with their parents suffering um, mm -hmm. uh, in that time, the 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 extreme ac activities that had to be taken by the by the by the central banks in the throughout the world meant that there was a new and growing distrust when people lost their jobs, when people suffered as a result of of what you know sort of a reckless banking system was was actually doing. But we have learned certain lessons since then. What is uh, what 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 are you hoping the the result you know, when, when, when you author a book, there's usually some type of, of uh, rhetorical goal. Like, this is what I'd like people to believe, yeah. or this is what I'd like people to understand. What's yeah. the number one uh, goal that when someone reads this book, what are you hoping will, will come into their mind? And what type of actions do you think people might take as a result of what you've written? Well, and it's a great question. Uh, and it sums up exactly why I wrote the book. Because in the end of the book, there is a, a two-letter word, and it's called co. And uh, you know about co-working, um, co-living, uh, co-investing. Uh, we've we've had those co's around for a time. When but I was in college, the when I was in college, it was called a co-ed, and that was the most important co that we had. So yeah, well, I understand I'm that. Sure, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm quite sure, but I won't ask any more questions. Uh, <laughs> It's how we um, got married. How we got married. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> there we are. Oh, sounds good. Um, but then what happens is we haven't had what I call co-destiny. So my great wanting is, you know, can we have a co-destiny in which the generations, rather than having a clash of generations, which is pretty well what's happening at the moment, levels of distrust between the generations, the envy and the anger that the younger generation feels for the older generation when they can't buy their houses anywhere in the world in any major capital city. Uh, can we have a co-destiny where, whereby the generations actually work together such that uh, an older generation will be mentoring, co coaching, teaching, investing and correcting um, a younger generation in in the way in which they make their investments and a younger generation actually respecting an older generation to say, look, I can learn from you. There's a certain amount of wisdom that you have. Uh, and so you put the two together and we begin to see a, a new cooperative venture growing right throughout the world because this generational divide is pretty well everywhere. And we have to navigate it in, in our own self-interest to ensure that we don't have a you know, a, a breakdown in, in the social structures within our, within our communities. Yeah. I mean, they have a huge responsibility because they have a lot of power with, a, with less experience and yet they have the ability to learn faster than any generation. They have the ability to get information and advance faster than any generation. I understand and empathize the mistrust. You look at the baby boomer generation and, you know, what they constructed in terms of you know, fiscal problems around the world, uh, monetary policies, printing of money, uh, and the the environmental stewardship. Uh, you know, they, I think this younger generation sees themselves of having to solve things like climate change, uh, you know, very serious problems financially. So I understand the mistrust, but also I applaud the idea of, of dialogue. You know, my, my father's still living uh, as an octogenarian and, you know, getting late into there and there's wisdom there, the late Charlie Munger, who we uh, lost, uh, yeah, sadly. Know, a few, a few weeks before his hundredth birthday and the wisdom of, uh, of, a of 
you know, close to being a centigenarian. Uh, yeah. the, those there's wisdom in Buffett and wisdom in Munger that my, you know, 14 and 16 or my 16 and 17 year old sons can understand. So, uh, well, and glean that's... from. That's absolutely right. And that is the part of the handover. This is not simply a handover of finances. It's a handover of, of a, a reciprocal understanding of, of, of wisdom, of experience, of, of you know, being able to navigate the uncertainties that the world face, faces. And, and that's why I think it's going to affect the investment decisions of practically everybody. I mean, you, can't, you can't separate it out. And wealth managers all over are going to wonder how do we manage to so uh, come alongside the uh, that next generation. I'll give you an example. My daughter, we had a little bit of money that we gave her, and we said, well, go and talk to your advisor. Um, and I know, you know, you don't particularly want to be investing in in what I call the sin, uh, the sin stocks of gambling and drinks and smoking. Yeah. And she said, Daddy, you see, you, you don't quite understand. I don't want to just say something that I don't want to do. I would like money to be actually used to do something positive, to have a, a, a real effect. Um, and I'd like an investment from that. And so there's that sense of wanting to do good, um, but also wanting to do well. And the generation yeah. feels very strongly about you know purposeful um socially energized uh, capitalism that there is a purpose to what we are doing that's a great place and that's exactly where i wanted to land is because most people tune in to become informed in you know how do we make more informed investment decisions and there's no crystal ball but the reason we run a fundamental analysis on a company is to see if we believe it has a moat you know can it last uh I'm pretty sure Gen, Gen Z is going to have a Coke and a smile and their grandkids will have a Coke and a smile. That company was started in the 1800s. It's probably not going anywhere uh, with technology, right? AI isn't going to change the formula, at least they hope not. But when it comes to, uh, you know, if I'm listening and I read the book, how does that inform my investment decisions? How does it inform yours? You're an investment banker. How, have you, how, how does this inform your decision making? Well, I think that what the, the, the way in which we're going to approach the decisions means that we have to take a broader context of where we're operating uh, and to be able to, to navigate uh, the choices of our investments into the changes in, in, the, in, in, in the world, but with a recognition that you can't, you can't just force a divide. So let me give you an example. Um, throughout the world, the, the big moves that are happening is uh, there's a move from young, from old to young. Yes, we've discussed that. There is from brown to green. There is from um, east, uh, from west to east, and from men to women. So there is a, a significant uh, uh, move uh, in the feminization of finance. And they're going to be in the in, in the U.S. at the end of this decade. There will be ten trillion dollars that will be in, uh, under the control of women uh, who will be running companies and investments, whatever. So one wants to be able to look to see how is it that those that have not had voices before are are managing the new generation companies, whether it's uh, the millennials who will be in major corporate uh, corporations in the next 10 years, they'll be the majority. So I want to know, what is your succession plan for that next generation? If, the, if you're a 60 or 70 year old entrepreneur, is there a 40 year old that is coming on? If there is, I'd like to look at that investment and how it should be invested. Uh, and if there is, you know, uh, under you know, where, where where capital has been scarce, obviously capital is always scarce and best deployed where it is scarce, who is managing it with an understanding that they can get a good return, but also that they achieve social objectives in getting that return. The, the feminization of it is an important thing. Buffett has spoken about that. He's talked about the idea that for so many decades, we've been limiting to really half the resource that we have you know, new people come out like Med, Meg Whitman is a, you know, she, she's someone who represents very, very intelligent leader, you know, highly educated Harvard, all that good stuff. So 
Uh, it's going to be a fun thing to see. I, I, I worry a little bit about the circumstance that these young people inherit. But as I look at my sons, at least in the two that I've uh, get a chance to mentor when they listen, uh, I'm filled with tremendous amount of hope. Their inherent sure. goodness, their Absolutely. their love for fellow man. Uh, I have a lot of hope. Sure, I think it's a. I, I, I the way I characterize it, it's a prophetic generation. It's we would not be as far advanced in the concern for the planet, and um, if it hadn't been for the agitation from that generation. Now you may say it's gone too far. Um, we have to explain that there isn't a lever that is brown and you pull it and it goes green. <laughs> there is a there is no, a period it's... of time that is practical uh, over which you work through the uh, you know the, the the major issues. So basically time scale, because young people want everything done tomorrow. We've been around. We know that the best things mature, take it over a period of time. So I'm very hopeful. I think it is a generation that uh, will continue to be more productive, even though at the moment there is a there is a, a view that they don't want to do any work and, you know, it's a bunch of feckless <laughs> avocado eaters and, uh, and the only crisis that occurs is when the battery doesn't charge my iPhone. But, I mean, it is a serious one. There are serious issues. Mental health is a serious yeah. issue in the next generation. And sure. we need to help to understand that, you know, th this is always on. And if it's always on, you know, it is going to have a serious effect on your mental health. We need to help build boundaries. We need to help build um, very clear borders for which um, they will be operating in. And if we get that right, I think we can start picking those companies that are conducive to working with the next generation rather than merely tolerating them. I, uh, I, I'm i going to recommend your book. Go to KenCosta.com. You can also go to Amazon, The $100 Trillion Wealth Transfer. How the handover from boomers to Gen Z will revolutionize capitalism. You can get it at Amazon.com. I was invited to uh, an event unlike any I'd been to uh, a couple of weeks ago. A dear friend of mine, extremely successful, uh, had uh, had booked the the best venue in Salt Lake City for an incredible you know meal of lobster and steak. And it started out as a political event and the political candidate had a schedule change. So here this guy has this huge venue with, you know, a hundred lobsters ready to go. And he said, you know what, I'm going to turn a lemon into lemonade. And he said, he changed the title of it and got rid of all the politics in it. And he said, an evening with interesting people. And wow. he invited, and I was fortunate somehow to make that list. I don't know how, but I got the chance to mingle with some of the most interesting leaders, entrepreneurs, politicians, religious leaders, and it was just a room filled with savvy people who had interesting lives and it was a great networking opportunity. And when I read your bio, I thought we should have invited Ken. Oh, I'd have loved to. <laughs> the chance, the the chance to the the reason I, the, I'll tell you how I would pitch this book to the listeners is the chance to sit down with someone and gain their thoughts who grew up in South Africa, was part of the anti-apartheid, who became an investment banker, who has, you know, who's had a life such as yours, just the chance to curl up with the book and get your thoughts and insights. Uh, it, it, well, a person, there's certain things I've read where I felt my IQ dropping. And there's certain things I've read where I felt my IQ struggling to increase as low as it is. I'd put yours in, uh, in the latter category. If you want to get smarter, yeah. Gain insight from someone who's been around the block and who is, uh, who's had experience that, that you and I might not have had. So uh, with that, I'll give you the last word. Any, any final words for, uh, for our listeners in moving forward? What would you have to say to them about, uh, about the topic? Uh, what I would say, if you're a boomer, um, don't be embarrassed by the fact that you are. Um, there's a <laughs> lot that the next generation can learn from you. And if you are a Zennial, born after 82, um, whether a millennial or a Gen Z, uh, learn as best you can from an older generation. You'll find that that will give you a far better perspective for doing life well. You can do good and you can do well, but you need to learn that uh, from the people that have also been around the block in hard times and in good times. 
I, I love the interaction learning both ways. I, I did something different. I'll just share this as a, as my final thought. Uh, when I grew up, my father had a tradition called family night or family evening where he would gather the children around, you know, he's very much a, a an older boomer, right? Um, and he'd gather the children around, he'd teach us, you know, and he, dad would teach us, you know, he, he grew up with FDR fireside chats, you know, dad's going to oh, teach. Yes. Yes. And when I, when I had my children, I reversed it. And when they were four and five years old, I put them in charge of family night. And I said, what would you like to teach mom and dad? And wow. they would pick something and, and, and the inherent goodness, you say, yes. dad, you know, my five-year-old kid, I want to teach about sharing. Oh, what is sharing? What does it look like? And, and I wow. have never reversed that even as teenagers, I always have them teach me. And I've learned so much about their goodness. I've learned so much about them that the idea of the communicating back and forth, learning from each other. Uh, I think it's a beautiful idea. I think it makes our, our world a better place. So well, I, uh, I couldn't agree more. And just thank, you brilliant. So much. thank you so much to you and to anybody listening to this. And I hope it's been a little help. Uh, let me the mention day. the let mention the book, The Trillion Dollar Wealth Transfer, How the Handover from Boomers to Generation Z Will Revolutionize Capitalism. My guest has been Ken Costa. Ken, if you'd hang on just a bit after I close the show so I can properly thank you. You've been listening and watching the Cashflow Academy podcast. This is where we do our best to make money and investing simple. I uh, hope you drop by yourinvestingclass.com, see some of the goodies we have there. And with that, uh, we thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.